Hello, uh, welcome. This is very weird. Um, this is uh, Motion North. I am Johnny. I'm the founder and creative director of Mighty Giant. And for the last few years, I've been the uh, curator of Motion North. Um, if you've been to one of these before, usually we would be in Federation House with a crowd of about 150 odd people and having a few beers, but obviously we're now online. So we're doing this monthly from now on for a bit, um, just to keep this going. And we've got some great people lined up, which we all um, mentioned towards the end. Um, the event is free. What we are asking is if you can make a donation to our um, chosen charity, which is Forever Manchester. Um, there's a link underneath on YouTube. If you could consider donating some money to them, they're doing some fantastic work during the crisis we're in at the moment. Um, and then before we get into the speakers, I'm just going to introduce you to Carl, who is here from our um, sponsors, AO, and he's just going to give you a little, little explanation as to why a appliance company is supporting Motion North. Yeah, um, so yeah, if anybody, if anybody does know us at all, um, hi, I'm Carl, by the way. Um, if anybody does know us at all, um, they probably know us, as, as Johnny says, for selling appliances. Um, uh, but actually, we we create a lot of content um, for a lot of different brands and show a lot, you know, a lot of different video content. Um, and so we're really proud to sponsor Motion North. Um, we want to be involved in the motion design scene um, in the area. Um, and we want people to know that, um, you know, we've got a big studio of people. We've got about um, all in all, including design, 3D, motion graphics, um, photography. Uh, we've got a studio of about uh, 80 to 100 now. Um, we do have open in it as you see creativity creative work we've got a lot of variety of work and um we're looking for new talent um that's looking for secure um and good work um at this point in time so if you are interested um my details are on the bottom there get in touch apply um and we'd love to speak to you nice one thank you um thank you carl i'll duck you out now and um, we'll catch up with you later. Um, so let's introduce you to Marcus. Yeah. Um, from Studio AKA and Jason from We Are 17. Hello. So I think probably the best thing to do here is first of all, should we show your showreels, Marcus? And then you can explain a little bit more about yeah. what you are and what Studio AKA are. So. Yeah, let's do that. So we'll go with, um, did we say the... Yeah, go with my, I've got a, a little showreel of my personal work and then follow it up with a showreel of Studio AKA's work as well, so you get to see a good range of the different type of work we do. Cool. So that's Marcus's personal reel. Yeah. This is Studio AK. You can explain afterwards what yeah. those are about.
Cool. Something about the studio, studio AKA reels always just make you smile, don't they? They're just uh, <laughs> lovely, yeah. lovely stuff. So, Mark, Definitely. tell us about your role and what, what you do with Studio AKA and how that works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I guess I'm represented as a uh, animation director at Studio AKA, um, and it's a studio. It's we represent AKA represents a number of directors and artists and kind of lots of visual people and we form quite a close-knit team um, so we're kind of in every day and we quite often work collaboratively and we work across kind of lots of projects like from commercials to short films we have a children's series in production that's Hey Dougie which people may have watched um, which is huge on CBBC um, and recently we've also been doing things like animated title sequences and story sequences that fit into feature films and TV shows and we've kind of been doing quite a lot of those recently. I think I've kind of seen that change a little bit um, and they're quite interesting and fun things to do. Um, and I guess for me, I, I, like, I love working there because I do get to collaborate with the other directors. I think that's important for me is I'm kind of an animator as well. I'm not just a, a director. I've always kind of started animating and so animating on other people's jobs is kind of what I enjoy to do at the same time. And I guess, yeah, the studio, I guess the core kind of principles of the studio, it's always about character. Um, I think that's one of the main things is so much of the jobs and the work that comes out of the studio have a, like strong characters. And I think we've got lots of talented people in the studio that really can really bring those characters to life. Um, so I think that's, kind of a good yeah overview of the studio and my role is is a director and I guess things that have like pictures come to the studio um and some places maybe the pictures you know they get tailored to certain directors but here or at least for me it's quite open that a pitch that may be a 3d pitch even though I do lots of 2d stuff I can still pitch on that and try and win that and I think that's quite a liberating for me at least is being able to challenge yourself on these pitches and they come in and then yeah try and win these jobs and got a big uh, production team to bring it all together um, and we work with freelancers and we have in-house permanent uh, staff as well um yeah i think that's a good description <laughs> very good good stuff um right well we'll have a look through we are 17 real now and then Jason can give a little explanation of what you guys do. Lovely stuff. I think um, what I love about the way are 17 reel is is there's such a wide variety of stuff, but there's a look, there's a we are 17 look to it throughout. Um, so Jason, what's your role there? And can you give us a little rundown on your studio? Yeah, sure. So I'm one of two creative directors at We Are 17. Uh, we're a very kind of design-led studio. Uh, we work across uh, work across TV, a um, lot of web, um, uh, 3D, 2D. We're kind of quite a flexible studio, but we're also quite a small team. Um, and we're very much like a team of generalists. So uh, we work, uh, like me and Steve, we'll work together on projects um, as... Uh, Steve's the other creative director, by the way. 
uh, me and Steve work together on jobs as uh, both like if one of us is an animator and an art director you know we're very flexible in our roles and everyone else in the team is very much they're kind of it's very much the same um, everyone works across everything um, we're very kind of we're both very hands-on with uh, with the work um, we predominantly our work is uh, is CG but we like I said we do do a lot of kind of 2d as well um, I think we're I just think we're kind of quite uh, we're quite flexible we're quite kind of client based I think so uh, we're very much there to like fulfill uh, uh, a, a kind of vision we're not we're not very kind of ego led studio um, I know we kind of like I think it's true we do have like a little bit of a look but that's that's kind of I think that's down to us being quite a small team as opposed to like there being a real kind of push for a cool look or anything like that. Um, yeah. I no, I, I meant it more in a sense that there's a, there's a consistency across it. I think, I think there's, there's, um, it's, it's not very, it's not tangible what it is, but there's there no, we can pick it up. No, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I do. I totally know what you mean. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Right. That's the sort of intro to you guys. Um, what we're going to do now is Marcus is going to take us through a project um, if I can find, is this you, <laughs> yeah. is this you Marcus? Yeah, that's us, ready. So we've got this lined up, it's a little sort of run through. Um, if people do want to ask questions, um, please ping us on, on YouTube, I can pick those up. What we'll probably do is go through some stuff with Marcus now, and then we'll go through Jason as well, and then probably pick up on the questions afterwards. But um, yeah, so Marcus, I'll leave you to sort of introduce what this is about. Great, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna do a bit of a behind the scenes and kind of full look at um, the production of my E4 Ident um, that was made last year for E4's new rebrand. Um, I'm just gonna look at the whole production from the start um, all the way to the, to the end and kind of all the little bits in between and all the fun behind the scenes stuff um, and talk about how it was made. Um, so I guess first part of call is the film. So uh, I think we'll play that next and then we'll talk about the different parts of the production. Cool. So, um, yeah, that was the that was the film, and what you're seeing now is this is kind of where it all where the whole thing started, and this was the pitch that we sent over to E4, um, and we also sent uh, Christian, another one of the directors, at AKA he did another pitch which was successful as well. So we've got two um, idents that are on E4. You might see them at some point, and uh, this one uh, because of its content can only be played after the watershed, I think, which was, uh, I felt that was quite an achievement for me. I was quite happy with that. Um, but so this is where it all started. Um, and as you can see, I just went went big on pictures and a little on words. Um, and I'm not entirely sure where this idea came from, um, but the main kind of, what was great about this job to start with was that E4's brief to us was very it was a really open brief you could really do anything and it ended with the words surprise us <clears throat> sorry my voice is gone it ended with the word surprises um which for me was a good good sign to be able to almost just do something bold and crazy um and i just somehow came up with this idea of these two big cats with the logos of the e and the four kind of on their furs just meeting across this big, crazy pink neon desert. Um, and then, yeah, having sex and creating a, a weird E4 baby um, and falling into this big pool of digital noise. 
Um, <laughs> and it was a bit, yeah, I'm not entirely sure where that all came from, but I think it was crazy enough that uh, they wanted to see it. So uh, we got that job, which was great. Um, and then, yeah, and then production, then I had to work out how to do this thing. Um, and so when we got, uh, got that job, we started here um, and this was kind of this this was the stuff that I was looking at at the moment uh, while I was getting that job. I think that Blade Runner film had come out um, and I quite liked this the the idea of the desert being this you kind know, of just huge pink expanse with a really short drop off so there's this kind of heavy fog um, and the those the big cats kind of emerging out of that. Um, and that was that was the main idea behind it um, and just wanted it to look really dramatic um, and it was about just being kind of bold and in your face with the colors um, and the the picture in the middle has got quite a funny story because that's a charcoal drawing by Trevor Grimshaw and he does these quite uh, kind of bleak charcoal drawings of uh, industrial towns um, and mills and mines and um, actually found that picture I was watching an episode of Cash in the Attic if anyone knows that um, and it's where they go into uh, people's attics and find antiques and sell them at an auction um, and someone had one of these pictures in their attic and I saw it and I was like oh, that's really interesting and then it led to me finding their drawings um, and I've used those I use those quite a lot in lots of projects I I really like that aesthetic. Um, so this is where kind of the ideas for the world were coming from. Um, and in the end, I kind of, I did want some of this kind of decaying and destroyed buildings in there. Um, but it ended up, they were kind of too many details and the real focus was on the cats. But I did want it to feel like we were, this neon pink desert was, Kind of inside your TV or inside the internet somewhere, some strange technological wasteland, and I was going to have different destroyed buildings and technological stuff, whatever that means. Um, but it was kind of detracting from the main feature of the film, which was the two cats. So that I ended up scrapping that and just kind of going leaning quite heavily to the Blade Runner uh, reference in the end. Um, and then, so from there, started, went to the character designs. And this is something that happens. I don't know whether other directors in my situation probably will uh, recognize this issue of, you know, you do these pitches um, and you, you know, you spend a while designing stuff and, you know, you just go, you go for it with the design. You want to wow people. But you're not sometimes you're not necessarily thinking 20 stages ahead of how difficult that's going to be to make um and this was this job was definitely one of those because on the pitch i spent ages drawing all those little e's and the fours on the cats um and not once did i really think oh wait i'm gonna have to animate this stuff at some point um and so but that's the good thing at AKA is that there's, you know, we have a, a permanent team of 3D um, staff that are kind of there to help out in this situation. And that's what I had to do with this was to use 3D and then 2D trace over the top of it because we could uh, put the logos, the E and the four logos onto the cat in 3D and have that as a, a layer over the top. And so that, that, that suddenly made it a lot easier again. Um, and as something as a, a director, I'd, you know, this job kind of opened up lots of opportunities for me because I'd always wanted to direct uh, something in 3D. I'd never, I hadn't done that yet. It was, I've always wanted to do something, to direct something that I haven't got a direct kind of skill in doing. You know, I, I do lots of 2D things and, uh, it's nice to be able to step back and have talented people animating and designing these things um, and kind of you're trusting them to do to do their job and to, you know, get better results than you could yourself. 
Um, and so that's this job was really exciting for that reason that I could work with 3D um, and you know get, get achieve the results that I wanted. Um, and on this image as well, actually, <clears throat> you can see one of the kind of struggles that we had was that part way through the film, E4 decided that they didn't want the actual four, the old four logo appearing um in the film that so which kind of ruined the the design and almost the concept of the whole film so that's what this the the design on the bottom right that was a an extra design that we had to come up with to try and use those elements of the four but to but not form them into the full four and in the end we were able to go back because they changed their minds again which was great because you know the the top one is much clearer in terms of what is going on in the story and the bottom one is to, there's a bit more of a leap that you have to do to understand what's happening even though the the bottom right one does look pretty cool um but yeah we changed it back again which was which i was quite happy about um so then next after this stage we went to the animatic and started forming the story. So I'm going to play that first animatic so you can see the difference from that to the the full film. And well, it's probably it's not actually that different because I think a lot of the shots stayed kind of quite close. So we'll play that next. <laughs> Okay, so that was the uh, the animatic, and I guess one of the things that I like to do as a director is a lot. A lot of the times, you kind of go through these processes with you know with the agency with clients. You do um, you kind of do you start with you know your designs, and then you do the storyboard, and then the animatic. And I don't necessarily like the storyboard phase because there's no uh, there's no um, there's no idea of pacing. It's just kind of just pictures on a board, and I like to just get straight into the animatic. So I always go straight to the animatic, um, and and that means that the kind of early conversations are all about pace and structure, and rather than just guessing at a board. Because I think a lot of the times someone looks at a storyboard, and then when they see the animatic, it's different to what they expected it. So I like to just go straight in with the animatic. Um, and with the music, my brother actually found that track. We've got a little shared playlist that we do, um, and I, I really liked it. Like fitted perfectly. It's one of those things cause when you're editing something and you put a bit of music on, and then all of a sudden everything's just working at the right times. It was that kind of feeling. Um, but I think yeah, we didn't use it. I think that <laughs> it would have blown the budget to have used this, the, um, a song like that. So um, we had to compose something with kind of similar sensibilities. And um, it's what we ended up with in the end. I, I really like what we came up with. David uh, uh, composed that for us. And um, it had lots of like jungly techno tribal themes that made the, the cats kind of feel quite mysterious and powerful. Um, so that's the animatic. And what you can see here is some of the layouts that I did um to kind of there they were for the 3d guys to kind of compose their shots um and pose the characters and get that going um and to kind of i like to do this stage because it gets you gives you a quick feel for the film and you can see what it's like color wise <clears throat> even though this was mainly the same color all the way through but uh it's it's i quite like this stage of designing um so then, this is some of the uh, animation, and I'll put this on a put this on a loop as I play it. Um, so this is the first 3D animation. Um, 
<clears throat> I was kind of most excited about this. Um, but it was it was quite a challenge when you haven't uh, directed 3D animation before because you're kind of looking at it like this and it's hard to imagine the final product from here. It's just uh, a lot of grey lumps everywhere. Um, so it's quite an interesting challenge. And particularly with the bit that you see now, the kissing bit, that was the hardest to pull off because <clears throat> in the animation it feels like they're just two heads um, and Laurent, the animator, um, we, were <laughs> we were really struggling with that scene because there's no real reference to go from. It's, you know, you're not going to be able to find something like this <laughs> that, uh, that you can kind of copy from or take ideas from. And they don't look quite, their faces aren't human enough to copy from that. So it was just this heads going together and hoping for the best that when I added the 2D stuff, that we'd be able to pull it off. Um, so that was quite a, it was a fun challenge. Um, and, you know, you can see both from the, on the next slide that it, uh, that it came together. Um, so where shall I look? In the top left, <clears throat> you can see um, that was, that's where I added the 2D tongues and things on there. And that was quite a, a fun thing to do. It was felt quite disgusting and making that a very uncomfortable uh, scene. But um, you can see what the 2D added into it and it really helped make it feel uncomfortable and uh, quite gross. Um, and that was the, the kind of aim for that scene. Um, and again, like on the bottom right, we were able to, the 2D, the 2D animation kind of allowed me to add details like fur um, and give them, give the animals more expression, like furrowing their brows and adding little wrinkles that would have taken much longer to develop in 3D um, and kind of helped it feel back to my original designs, those inky lines. Um, and that's what we were always trying to do, was trying to get it back there and use the block colours and shadows and things to give it that feel. Um, so, yeah, this kind of shows how much the 2D could, uh, added to those scenes. Um, and then the next one is I've got a, a breakdown of all of the different layers that went into into a shot, so you can see it all come together. Um, and I quite, I quite like watching this one. Um, so you can see, we started with the 3D model, added in the logos, added in the purple color and the TV paint, in TV paint, which is, I guess that's, that's the software that we use the most at, uh, AKs, uh, on 2D jobs is we use TV paint, um, adding those lines and then adding the shadows as well. And then, um, adding different bits like the dust effects the lines rushing past to kind of help it feel faster and dynamic. And then like the most happens in After Effects. And that's kind of my favorite point is getting all of those layers and everything into After Effects and really kind of pushing this, the image as far as you can and trying to, trying to get something feeling really dynamic and quick. And that's what I was able to do in After Effects. And one of the main things I wanted to do was make it feel like, uh, particularly on this scene, was that maybe it feel, felt like we had a, uh, a documentary crew kind of filming this event going on. So they're on some kind of really fast vehicle following this uh, cheetah sprinting across the desert. And they're really struggling to, to lock onto it and to keep up with it. Um, and so that's what the camera move did in After Effects was to kind of add that effect and make it feel like we were a documentary crew watching this event happen. Um, and adding in just all the little specks of dust and things like that. Um, and then that was, and then that was it. I mean, that's, and that was the kind of, you know, the full production of the, the job. That was all the different processes and layers. Um, and it was a really, a really fun job to do. Um, and, it's kind of one of my favorites, I guess, that, that I've done at AKA because I was able to kind of was just able to go a bit crazy, make it as bold and crazy as I wanted because that was the E4 audience um, and they and they really responded well to it in the meetings. So it was just kind of keep pushing and keep uh, making it even crazier and, and really pushing those 
garish colours. Um, and so that's that, really. Um, and I just thought I'd follow it up with a few... Um, I'm able to follow it up with these. Do you want to go up back in? Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. I, was just, I just had a few... After this project, I just wanted to show just a quick few quick things of the different designs yeah, go for it. that we've done at AKA as well, just because there's like that kind of stuff. But then this is some of my work for pictures that I either haven't won or that I have won um, that just show a different type of design as well. Um, and so this was for um, a TV show called Giri Hadji, um, which was on BBC. And Christian, the other director, he won that job. Um, but these were my designs from that uh, that pitch. So I just thought I'd show show these different, you know, all the different stuff that we're we're doing from day to day in this year because this it kind of changes every day you know one day we'll be animating that thing and then suddenly we'll have a day to do another quick pitch that's in a totally different style and like the next one like this was a totally different style um which i didn't uh, we didn't win in the end but i really i really liked doing this one um it was good fun to just do something completely different and then this completely different again and this is one that i did win which is for new york public library and on their instagram you can go on and they have um these things called insta stories and they're releasing kind of short novels onto instagram stories and they each have a a animated cover um and this was quite fun it was very contained and very quick but it was quite a, a fun job and this was for halloween for edgar Allan poe's the raven and um I was, yeah, it's, this is like a totally different style, very graphic and very all in After Effects. And that was something different for me as well. But kind of the pitch process allowed me to, to like achieve those things that I wouldn't normally do. Um, and then that's that. Um, I think that concludes everything. Very good. Everybody's applauding, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be pleased to know we've got an audience of four, so everybody's... Uh, there go. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's, a, there's a lot more than four, and we're getting some lovely comments coming in. Um, that was great. Um, yeah, well, please, if you've got any questions, please stick them in the uh, chat, because yeah. we, we have got time afterwards. Um, but we're going to crack on and let Jason um, talk through a bit about we are 17 run through one of their projects there as well so um jason we starting off with the um slideshow going into that first uh yeah, yeah i'll go into that and then the project comes a little bit cool and um, so i just All right. i just briefly wanted to touch on the kind of on the team and a bit a little bit more about we are 17 before i jumped into a jumped into a project go um, for it <clears throat> okay over to you so this is uh this is me and steve we so we're the we're both the creative directors at Seventeen, and Steve is also the co-founder. Um, there is a reason that there's sort of childhood photos. Um, basically, that everyone always asks what what the name We Are Seventeen comes from, and it's according to Steve and George, it's how they felt when they started the studio. They kind of just felt like kids again because they didn't really know kind of what they were doing. Um, this is actually kind of my first design talk as well, so I kind of feel a bit similar so i thought i'd kind of just run with that um, the only thing you really need to know about steve is the kind of jason statham thing i think uh, so what i thought i'd do is just go through a little bit of both of our personal work uh, and sort of like a little bit of pitch work as well uh, just as a way to show like what both of us are about and then you can kind of you could probably pick through our site and see which jobs we directed and stuff it's kind of just it's kind of interesting uh, so this, this uh, first of all, go through a little bit of my work, um, some pottery. Uh, this is a this is a job that was very uh, close to my heart and unfortunately will never see the light of day, but I like to be able to show little parts of it occasionally. Uh, another one from that. Uh, this is sort of just based off of the BBC ident that we did. Um, people have seen that and some generative coral uh, and a bit more coral. Um, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of generating coral. Apparently that's that's what I've spent my uh, my downtime for the last like three or four months doing. Um, uh, this is on Steve's work. I, mean, I think you can already see like, you can already see the difference in sort of 
tone and voice and stuff with the work. Um, Steve kind of likes ropes in the same way that I like coral. Uh, some some lovely lovely pretty flowers, and some weird machines. Uh, Steve will hate me describing these. Uh, I I also wanted I asked Steve to put in a little bit of this photography because I think what's really interesting about Steve's photography is that it, uh, I think it really it. Uh, it is like a follow-on from his 3D work. There's sort of like an aesthetic to the whole thing, um, which I find kind of really interesting. And it's also just, you know, some pretty sweet street photography. Uh, so yeah, that's just like, it's, it's really fast, but I just wanted to run through really quickly sort of our two voices. Uh, and, you know, I, I know that it's a, it's a common thing in larger studios, but we are a really small studio. So it's kind of interesting that um, that we have quite distinctive and different uh, sort of visual styles. Um, moving on to the rest of the team, George is the uh, is the co-founder, other co-founder of We Are 17. Uh, and then we have Jade, our producer, uh, and Michaela, our studio assistant. Um, I won't read out the facts, you can read them. Um, but on, George is the the world's biggest uh, Tunnox fan. It's it's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, and then we have our designers. We've got uh, David, who is our graphic designer, um, along with every single other job under the sun, including a horse nutritionist. Uh, and then we have Steve, Kana, and Nicholas. Um, Steve used to be Steve. I don't know why he's now Steve. You'd have to ask him. Um, I, I, I said to Kana that I would explain what a uh, Chevarashka is. Uh, apparently, it's a it's a Soviet era uh, animated bear that became a kind of popular anime in Japan, um, and she dressed up as that as uh, one of her first jobs in a shopping mall. Uh, and then uh, Nicholas is our kind of resident Houdini expert. So that's just a little bit about the team. Um, and now I'm going to jump into our, uh, the job that I'm going to be talking about. Um, just, just a brief description of what it is. Uh, it's for Vizio, the um, American TV manufacturer. Uh, and every year when they release new TVs, they do a series of in-store films and they kind of loop together to uh, show uh, different aspects of the TV. So like, clarity was one of them, uh, contrast, um, and the one that we ended up doing was colour. Um, the the film is in two two parts. Well, it's, it's two separate films, um, and I'll try and kind of explain afterwards why we have two, uh, two colour films that essentially do the same job back to back. Uh, so, yeah, you can, you can play that now. So, yeah, uh, our film was kind of all about colour, so it's like, it's incredibly saturated, it's insanely saturated, uh, you know, about sort of the breadth of colour that these TVs can show. 
but uh, we so to try and explain why there are two we need to kind of talk about our initial pitch um, and we basically pitched on the basis of this one board um, and and discussions with uh, the uh, the agency who worked with Visio called Partner. Uh, so we pitched this idea of eye candy uh, with just, uh, well, I, yeah, it's quite self-explanatory what the idea is, I think. Uh, and it was something that, it was something that Partner really liked and something that we were quite keen on, but ultimately something that they said the client, Visio wouldn't, be particularly interested in um, and I mean you can kind of tell that they were interested in it because one of the films is all it's called Eye Candy and it's and, and it's basically this idea uh, but um, it took quite a lot of production to get to that point where the client realized that that was kind of what they were after um, so once once we pitched this idea and had that kind of feedback, uh, we went back to the drawing board a little bit um, and we created these colour stories with uh, an illustrator called Sylvie, who we work with a lot. She does a lot of our storyboards and helps with ideas and stuff. She's, she's really great. Um, and uh, we created these just to kind of, just to like strip it back completely um, and just kind of like pick, pick our palette apart and and figure out what colors would go with what uh, with a vague idea of what these objects might be but sort of then went on to um to picking apart those color stories and working out with the client working out with visio what exactly they did want in these films uh, because they had a kind of they had a lot of things that they weren't so keen on um, but but it, it was like, it was a bit of a process to get them to a point where we knew what they what they did want in there, um, and this was this was part of that. So just breaking down those color stories and figuring out what objects they could be, um, and then uh, and then we moved on to uh, illustrating ideas. And uh, one of the kind of interesting things about this project uh, was that they didn't really want to see any animation for a long time they kind of uh, they wanted to see they wanted to see stills and they wanted they wanted to see stuff basically that looked final on their TVs so they could go yeah that looks great on our TVs and sign that off as opposed to you know a more traditional kind of process um, so like normally we would alongside this kind of stuff and this is stuff that I really like to do um, I think they I think illustrating ideas out like this is a, is a great way to get them across uh, but we would normally typically do um, like CG development and R&D and stuff alongside, uh, whereas on this project, we almost exclusively used the, used these kind of idea boards. Um, a couple more of these, uh, these idea boards. And you can kind of see like, you know, these can be great tools to get across ideas really fast. Um, and if clients really like them, you know, some of these things some of the things in the final film are incredibly close to these um so yeah they can be they can be really great tools uh and uh, it works it works really well on this job um the balancing idea is uh, uh, yeah i really like that i think that's one of my favorite parts parts of the film um i'm, I'm glad they i'm glad they agreed uh following on from the storyboards uh sorry following on from the idea boards uh, we moved on to some some storyboards for the different. Uh, we we didn't even know how this would go together or how it would move or anything. It was just like here's some ideas of what could happen, um, and then we sort of storyboarded them as little individual vignettes, uh, because like I said, they they just they wanted to see these stills of these ideas, um, but you know we had to think like okay, oh that's cool, but how how is that going to then translate into an edit? How is that going to translate into an animation? Uh, and you know, there's no there's no real narrative to this. It's just a series of it's just a series of pretty images, with uh, with sort of fruit and veg and sweets and stuff. So it doesn't need a storyboard. Uh, but for this particular project, because we didn't have any real three D time yet, 
uh, we we sort of storyboarded out all of these ideas as separate little things. Um, and they, I think they found that pretty helpful. I, I certainly found it really helpful to just envisage, start envisaging how this thing could actually come together whilst we're too busy worrying about what is actually, to, what, what the fruit's going to look like, you know. Uh, and then we did, uh, so then we started looking at kind of art direction, uh, what the what the fruit and veg would look like. Um, and this was just sort of part of their process of like all the all of the stills we did were in 4K um, and everything that we everything that we showed them was like every whip was like a 4K render so they could test it on their TV, um, which was quite it's quite a weird process, uh, but it really gets you thinking about like really fine details and stuff really early on. So we were really concentrating on the kind of render quality on the on the fruit uh, on the fruit and the veg and stuff. Uh, with that in mind, we used a lot of uh, photo scans and uh, they can be of kind of variable quality depending on where you get them from. Uh, we, we used a place called Creative Crops, which uh, is, is a really great resource of really quality meshes and really good base textures. You know, you need to work into all of these things, but they, they were really good quality. And then we also worked with a company called Sample and Hold uh, in London to photo scan some of the more kind of unusual or harder to find uh, fruit and veg. Um, the lettuce was, I think it was obviously not like a hard thing. To, it's not a, it's not a weird vegetable, but it is something that because of its leaves and stuff like that, it's really tricky to find and um, modeling it seemed kind of out of the question. So yeah, they did a really great, great job of photo scanning some of that. Um, and it was quite a fun trip to like a farmer's market to sort of just pick your way through the veg and see, uh, and try and find like the weirdest shaped, almost textural kind of marrow. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was kind of an interesting process. Uh, following on from that, we started working into style frames of the specific ideas. Um, and this was an idea that I, I personally really liked um, and I think partner liked as well. Um, it, it took a bit of took a bit of persuading um, um, and, I, and in the end Visio felt that it was kind of a little bit too kind of unexpected and weird, which I think is totally fair enough. Like if you're walking through a store on a TV and this orange shatters into loads of like weird little candy pieces, you know, I, 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 I totally understand there. They're thinking but it's kind of a, it's a shame that it didn't make it in because I, I quite like the idea we had a few ideas that were like quite unexpected um and that was a theme through a lot of our ideas of things happening to these fruit and veg that was just sort of um was not what you'd expect and uh, just unexpected for them to do uh, and some of that made it into the final films some of it i think just pushed it a little bit too far and this was one of them uh, these are some of the visual kind of experiments into the uh, sort of chili mandala shape. Um, we initially had this idea of there being like uh, spheres of uh, spices sort of in the middle and then exploding like little fireworks. Um, but uh, one of the sort of conditions on these TVs, because you've got a compressed the video to get them on the TVs, um, is to not have anything too fine, you know, like sand and stuff like that, to, um, because that could look like uh, could look like things like dead pixels, or it could sort of pixelate and stuff like that. So we lost that, but then we yeah we did this sort of exploration into different mandala shapes. We had an idea to make it more of a kind of spiral, but that never really. I mean, I think it looks cool in stills, but uh, and this was one of the problem with working with almost purely with stills is that they look, you know, they look cool. But then when you start animating that and you're trying to figure out how to edit that into another scene, it's like, it's quite a rigid, difficult thing to get out of or edit around. So we ended up with a more sort of traditional mandala-y kind of twirl. Uh, this guy, uh, they they really loved, um, we ended up with a kind of smoother texture on this, but um, I really like this kind of really detailed textural uh, icy, um ice lolly uh the the ice lollies were something that i think it was i think it was one of the reasons that 
uh, persuaded them that the eye candy idea was was a sort of was a good idea and a good and a good route to take because um, it was one of the first scenes that they saw moving and saw the colours of and they kind of they really loved it um, and I think that sort of made them made them then rethink a little bit. The other thing that made them rethink was these um, was these macarons uh, and. I can kind of see what I think. That, yeah, this I, I'm, I really like this style frame. Um, one of the things we did end up having to lose, which was a bit of a shame, that, that was the sort of general idea of these hard candies being um, being like the foam of a wave. So the the idea, the original idea for this was that it was like a lapping wave on a shore, with the uh, with the macarons being the water and then the the little candies being the foam. Um, it's like it's an idea that um, I, I tried to push for another job as well. And they didn't go for it. I think I need to drop this idea, but I, I still I still really like it. I think there's a place for it. So if anyone wants any like uh, any foamy waves, let me know because I'm I'm dead keen on doing this. Uh, but yeah, the the macarons as well. I think they just love the texture of them, um, and I think it it made them realise that the kind of eye candy thing it wasn't it didn't necessarily have to be whatever it was that was stopping them doing it. Uh, these were how the macarons looked in the final films. Um, I think they look pretty cool. Um, and then this is the kind of hero still that ended up, uh, I think that's on the on the boxes and stuff with the TVs. Um, and, and again, another one that, that sort of made them change their mind and just to kind of briefly explain how how that ended up in in production we ended up kind of about three weeks before the end um having to split production so that we had half the team working on um half the team working on the enchanting eats which is the vegetable one and half the team working on eye candy to take out all the vegetable shots and put in extra uh candy shots where uh, but repurpose the sort of ones that we'd already done that were candy related. So that's kind of how it ended up working, and it was it was kind of quite difficult, and uh, and it was yeah, it was it, it was a bit weird. But I think like both of the films kind of ended up they you know they both got their own merits, um, and I think they're both kind of strong pieces, and um, like a credit to the, the team and everyone involved in it that in the last sort of like two three weeks we managed to pull together these two films um and sort of double deliver for for physio um, and then finally like everything i've shown so far is stills uh, but i did just want to show a couple of the wireframes to sort of prove that we did actually end up doing some animation and because everyone loves a wireframe so uh, yeah Go, go ahead and play. <laughs> so short. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of it for eye candy. Um, busy oak, colour. Whatever you want to call it. So muted. So yeah, this is great, Jason. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we got we got a couple of questions in. Um, I'll kick off um, with one that we got earlier. Someone was asking how long. I think it's relevant to both of you actually. Um, how long the E4 project took? And also, I was going to ask Jason, sort of same sort of thing. Also, Jason, whether that was the whole studio working on a project like that. But, um, what about you, Marcus? How long was that for you? So I think maybe like in terms of like total production, I know it was quite, I, I never remember these things, but I know it was quite quick. But I think it was over like over the course of two months, I think, maybe. I think maybe that's realistic to say. I can't quite remember. But I think it was, yeah, maybe two months, maybe less than that. Um, I certainly remember 
the time for the 3D animation was about two weeks then maybe or something like that, two to three weeks to get to, I think we only had, I mean, it was quite a small team. We had one 3D animator, one person doing the modeling um, and the rigging and things like that. Um, and then a couple, t- yeah, yeah, and two extra uh, people helping me with the TV paint 2D stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, and it probably took around about two months, maybe um, around other projects and things what like about that. You, Jason? What about you, Jason? Was that the whole team working across that? Uh, mostly, there were yeah. It, it sort of bounced around between a few people. You know, when you're juggling who's working on what. I think there was there was like a core team of uh, four or five of us, um, and then when people had sort of spare time or we needed a bit of extra resource, like someone else would jump off of what they were working on and help for a few days or whatever. Um, and that's kind of, that's a typical way that we'll, we'll work that we'll have like a small core team and then people jumping in and out as and when they're needed. Uh, in terms of how long it took, uh, it was pretty similar to, we had six weeks for the initial film. Um, we, it ended up because it split into two, we took about seven or eight weeks, I think. Amazing. Um, um, question for Marcus from Ben, who says, says he's only been in motion design for the last couple of years and said, from your experience, what's one of the most important aspects to your job that helps you create great work? I guess that applies to both of you. Yeah, that's, a, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Um, for me, it's, I guess, like one, one thing that helps me create most of it. it's, it's kind of always looking at things, interesting things, reading books. That is like kind of living in that the world of seeing interesting things and watching something that challenges you always gives you new ideas and reading books and, and watching different films. That's, that's the thing that kind of keeps the creative juices flowing and helping you make interesting stuff. Because if you don't, you know, if you're never challenged by what you're watching or reading, you, you know, you need to know what it is an interesting thing and um, and to form the you know to form your own opinions about that stuff is what makes makes it interesting for other people to watch because they get your ideas from it um so i think for me it's yeah it's it's just kind of experiencing different media and books and stories and things like that i've always found to be the most helpful and if it's from you jason i i totally agree with that i think I think that's, I I kind of follow a similar path. One thing that I don't do is look at any other CG work. (laughs) Like my, I will pretty much every single pitch I ever put together will not have any other 3D work apart from stuff that we've created. And I tend not to look at any of it. Um, And that's not like, that's not because it's not inspiring. I just don't find it especially helpful. I find it slightly more helpful to like, Look at uh, look into different mediums and different art like art worlds. Uh, you know, like I've, I'm like, all constantly fascinated by ceramics art and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of all I've got to add to that. Yeah. Going outdoors as well, just go outside. <laughs> yeah, but but like the interest in ceramic stuff is, is going to lend itself into how your three D is realised, isn't it? So which you wouldn't get by looking at other people's work. Um, yeah, totally. There's, big fun there's of that. fascinating yeah. little textural details and stuff like that that you that you'd never pick up, and just like organic shapes and stuff that are just uh, like you know they're nothing that you'll ever see in three D. Well, you probably will, but you know it, it's it's a whole world into its own, and a kind of I think when you're creating work, it's more interesting to look outside of your own little yeah. sphere. You can kind of get dragged into following something as well if you look at something that's you know it within your world too much you end up subconsciously going in that direction and which is never a good thing um so yeah, yeah totally. that's that's a good yeah good caveat to it i mean i thought i'd touch on moving on from that a bit. um considering you were both meant to be in a room with us in april and we're now in bedrooms in july um <laughs> How, how have you guys adapted what's been going on since all this? How have your studios worked? I know, Marcus, you're on quite a big project. 
and how yeah. you're handling that. And, but Jason, you said this is not that different for you. If you could, yeah, uh, for me, to know how you've been coping. Uh, me personally, um, since I started at We Are Seventeen, I've always worked from home a couple of days a week. Uh, so we've always been set up for remote work, uh, and a bunch of us in the studio did odd days and stuff at home before. So we were quite well set up to then just make a really snap decision to work remotely. Um, and we've been set up with Slack for years. Um, we kind of communicate more on that than in person, even if we're in the office sometimes. Uh, it's like I, we're just naturally set up for that. So, yeah, for me, it's felt like kind of business as usual, except I can't I can't get like a decent lunch. <laughs> Uh, or I can't I can't go for a nice London pint you know yeah Yeah. Marcus what about you how's how's your project are you allowed to say what you're working on no (laughs) No. (laughs) around everything as usual Um, and that's the hardest thing is is you always have these projects and you can never say anything about them (laughs) but you're always busy Um, but yeah like it kind of well, it happened quite quickly at the studio, and I guess it's there was quite a lot of projects going on as well. So it had to be it happened well just right as I was starting the project, which I finished, you know, a, a couple of months ago, and um, we just had to suddenly work from home. I remember going into the studio because we had a, a flood at the studio as well. So there's and that was the Friday, and then the lockdown was happened on the Monday. So it was a bit of a crazy weekend. So I just remember getting a um, taxi from work, took my computer from work and all of the, ev- just everything, my Cinti, into the taxi, took it home with no idea of how we were actually going to work from home. But then uh, Fabrice, uh, who's our kind of technician guy um, at the studio, he kind of set everything up over the weekend somehow. And so kind of Monday afternoon I was working remotely from my computer um, and was able to access the server and so we've just kind of we were able we were able to get something quickly going and then we've gradually got better at it and you know it's one of those things that it's revealed lots of opportunities that all of a sudden you know like on the job that I'm working on now there's 10 people working on it and only two of them live in London and there's you know there's people uh, all over Europe um, working on this job and so all of a sudden you know we were a studio that we quite we quite like to have people in the studio because and I like I do like working in that way of being face to face with people and kind of walking around and seeing stuff um, but you know it's revealed that we can work in a different way um, and it doesn't matter where you are like we have been able to make it work so you know it's been it's, like, it's been a bit of a challenge but because it's been so busy, it's we've just had to adapt and just get on with it, and it uh, seems to have worked okay so far. And do you think it's going to be a long-term change? Do you think is, this is kind of where it's going? I mean, it's been a lot of people talking about it, so we don't need to dwell on it too long. But yeah. So I mean, we're we're looking at how we're going to, you know, how our office is going to run going forward. It's definitely up for grabs. Yeah, I think it's. I think well, it'll change definitely. Like, it will change in a similar way to what you were saying, Jason, of how you were working before. Of like, you're working three days at home or two days at home, or you know, and you're popping into the studio to see some stuff. But yeah, like, definitely means that lots of people can work from home, and there are lots of you know advantages, especially from living in London. It's yeah, you can't get a good lunch, but it saves you a lot of money on those lunches. Yeah. You don't have to yeah, spend all that money anymore, yeah. which is great. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I feel like long term, I don't think like the idea of people working in the studio together is going to die. Or that's yeah. not going to disappear. But I think that stuff like things like the four day week or like uh, flexible working hours, you know, I just think that it's maybe made people reconsider how they work um, and I think that will stick I don't know whether you know everyone working from home constantly will stick mm. but I, I do think it's made people 
genuinely reconsider the way that, that they work. Yeah. Maybe we'll get Marcus back to the north. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk too Claim much. Back. <laughs> One day. A couple of people have mentioned and um it's something I had on my sort of list was like how how you guys started out. Um you know, I think Jason, you said this is one of your early jobs or your first job. But you know, where, where did you come from, and uh, kind of what was your lucky break? What what brought you into things? I uh, when I finished uni, the the kind of the only thing that I knew that I didn't want to do is live in London, um, <laughs> and that kind of when you're looking for a motion design studio to work for, that limits your options quite a lot. Um, but I was lucky enough to get an internship at future deluxe when there were only like three of us three or four of us there um and i I mean absolutely god knows why because i did it with a print portfolio um but that is kind of yeah that was that was it that was that was a lucky break like i i was there for three years um and got to see that company grow and stuff like that um and i think that just that taught me a lot um and then I and then I freelance for a few years at a load of different places. And you know, when you're freelancing, you get all sorts of lucky breaks all the time. Um, yeah. So yeah. That's good. What about and you, how, Marcus? Oh, um, I was just going to ask quickly. If, Go on, yeah. Did, oh, um, it was just that. So, how did like we are seventeen like form? Was it something that was just kind of happening and it grew, or was it like a definite like let's start this? Let's well, start I mean, thing. That's, a, that's a question for Steve. I think that yeah. they were, Steve and George were working at an agency together. Um, I don't even think for that long. And they kind of didn't like it all that much um, and decided to sort of go out on their own. And that was like 12, 11, 12 years ago now. Okay. Yeah. So they, yeah, they've been, they've been doing it for a long time together. Um, I've been there for the last four years and only a creative director for the last year um but i think it was it was a pretty natural sort of we don't like the agency life that we're in so we're going to go and start yeah. this thing um, and that yeah they've been doing that ever since cool that's pretty good um i guess yeah like for me um i finished university at farnham and then i it's one of those things I just uh, felt like I needed to do more. I didn't feel ready to jump into a job at that stage. It was, I guess animation is quite a daunting thing because there's so many, so many variations of it. And with, with, with like a, even, you know, you spend three years learning it, you only ever learn a, a certain amount. Um, and so I went, applied to do a master's degree at the Royal College of Arts, and then I did two more years there, uh, which was great, and kind of let me carry on making films and trying different stuff out. And from there, I uh, after, straight after I graduated, I was represented by another company uh, called Film Club, and they were part of a uh, part of a bigger company called Thing One. And if you know, they closed down a few years ago. Um, and so I was there for a little while. And I, I didn't particularly enjoy it that much. Um, I didn't really like directing. I, really, I didn't really get much job, many jobs in that way. Um, so it, was, it wasn't the best experience. So even th- like a company closing down isn't a, a bad thing. But for me, it was a, a good thing because it let me kind of stop for a second. And then I started freelancing again and just freelancing as an animator. And then I kind of fell back in love with what I was doing and just enjoying animating characters and kind of enjoyed the the the, the kind of the non stress of being able to turn up on the day, do your bit of your job, and go home and not have to worry about it at night. Um, and I quite liked that for a bit, and managed to get a job at AKA um, through a friend of mine who recommended me for a job there, just doing some After Effects animation, which wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, and and I liked AK's work. Um, I wanted to do two D hand drawn stuff, so that was like a little foot in the door. And then I just kept asking for two D stuff, and ended up doing a test for Steve, one of the directors, because he does the TSB commercials. 
now those the watercolory kind of really tall um characters and i did the test for that and the day after i thought i'd done terribly because i got this four pages of notes on my little tiny animation test and i was just like that's it yeah not good enough that's okay um i'll keep going and and it was like a huge loads of notes um about like my eyes were moving around and all, you know all the volumes are on um and stuff like that but then maybe i must have done a decent amount of work um was so and then i'm they asked me to come in i think it was like a, the week after or something and started doing little bits on those tsp adverts and then i've just basically never left um just working on loads of different jobs at aka and then eventually they asked me if i wanted to be a director at the studio and i guess it just kind of things kept snowballing that i'd work on this job and then work on another one and then you know you'd get a little bit more responsibility every time and you'd help out on a different job and you know work out some kind of technique like there's lots of technical things that i was kind of helping with as well um and i worked with steve quite a lot so i kind of learned a lot from steve and just kept working my way up even though there's not there's not really like this kind of ladder system but it, it felt like that at the time of like oh i'm doing a little bit more this time i've got a little bit more responsibility um and it just kind of built like that and then yeah, just kind of carried on what, that same thing. One, one of the questions we've had from Praveen is, um, and it's sort of on that sort of note, like that was back then when you graduated. What would you be doing now if you were leaving college? Um, and obviously, I mean, these are meant to be hard times, but they are hard times. But in our industry, a lot of companies are flourishing. So, yeah. you know, there is a lot of work out there. But what would you be doing now if you were leaving college um, to get into this industry? <sighs> I mean, my uh, my portfolio was compared to some of the stuff that I see from students now, bloody terrible. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> probably be I don't know. Probably be looking for another career. <laughs> I definitely I definitely think it's harder now. At the base level, I think it's harder. Like why is, why is that? I don't know. I think it's maybe maybe when i started there were fewer companies there was maybe a little bit less competition it was kind of it was a younger industry um people took more risks i think possibly there's also now like a lot of small studios and they can't necessarily afford to hire and foster students um i don't i mean i i don't want to sound like negative about it i just think like it's a little bit harder now to have that like jumping off sort of platform i think they're, they're totally still there i just think it's a little bit harder to find than it was like five years ago go marcus give us a positive outlook i'll try um well i guess like i don't know from you know from my perspective now like what i what i'm looking for it, it's just actually quite changed quite recently that i've been you know for the job that i'm doing now is hiring more people and it is it's quite difficult to find people and it's about getting your work in the right places and also being really focused with what work you've got like even a tiny show reel or like one shot like one nice piece of animation that you've done is worth a lot compared to just like a show reel of loads of little bits in the wrong place and it's it can be quite hard to find you know when when you're like looking for new animators that you know yeah maybe starting at a junior level it's it's difficult to to find them and it's about getting you know it's like having a really simple i think yeah what i've learned is having like a really simple website that has the stuff where you need it to be. Like, I'm an animator or I am a junior animator. And this is my level. This is my, like, this is my best stuff. I think it's about being as clear as possible. Because if like I, you know, if I know someone is, is a, a junior animator that's, you know, just started, then I know what level, like, of work to give them. Because so, like I do like on a, on a certain jobs, like you do have animation that you have shots or 
that would be appropriate for a junior animator to do. And it would be good to get someone in who isn't as developed, but you know, they could they could develop and there could be an asset to your team. But sometimes it's just really hard to find people because they hide it among lots of other stuff. It's like I'm an animator, also a storyboard artist, also illustrator, also this thing. And you're like, ah, the you know, it's that's the problem. For me, that makes it easier. The problem with you hiding it and sort of trying to look like you're everything, you could end up in the wrong seat and on the wrong job, doing the wrong role, and then you know you're going to crash and burn straight off. So. I totally yeah. agree with that, being open about what you are, what your skills are, and yeah. put yourself in the right slot. But it's hard, to, I think it's hard to do because you're kind of, you're trying to hit out at all yeah. to see what you can get. And it's it like when you do leave university, you just, you're like, oh, I'm going to try and get some kind of job and I'll, you know, and if it gets desperate, you kind of go in any direction. But being as clear and, and concise as possible makes it easier for the people hiring you. And also just, like we've hired lots of people that send their real, you know, you send your reel into the studio and it depend if it's just the right time of like we're hiring for a project and a reel comes in, it the things might happen. It's it's just the case of being I well, when I graduated it was about being persistent and annoying people quite a lot. <laughs> I think I think one annoying of the, the good things now compared to like a few years ago is that there's a lot more that I've, I've not come across any recently of like unpaid internships because like yeah. internships it's now understood that it's like a paid role yeah. and yeah. that's really positive like i i think that it, like an internship became like a bit of a dirty word but i think they can be really useful ways in because you'll yeah. never learn more than you will on, on a job and sometimes just that experience is really important but i don't think you should be doing it for nothing like you're still working no i mean the, the sort of the lower paid internships allows companies to bring you know we do it bring people in who aren't exposed to the commercial work isn't it and then yeah. they can show that they deserve to be on the commercial work and then they get the job so yeah big fan yeah. of that yeah, yeah. Totally. i think it'd be like what well, staff heard people talking about is is offer like i don't know what stage these things are at but like offering something like and uh, like an apprenticeship kind of thing like this industry could benefit from things like that i think because it is you know if you've got some skills you don't necessarily need to go to university to expand those you, you know you could learn on the job yeah. in a way you get so much experience and because of the, the pace that things work at in a studio the pace is so much faster than you at school it's you learn so much on the go, you know, this stuff like, yeah, internships and apprenticeships would be an interesting thing to, for studios to do, I think. Yeah, totally. Right, I'm going to start wrapping it up. Um, my last question to both of you is who should we have on Motion North? Who would you like to see speaking? <laughs> 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 difficult <laughs> yeah i was i was gonna say uh i don't know if they have i was gonna say universal everything um uh no i've been okay. chasing him for about eight years so. <laughs> well uh yeah. i'll keep trying then Matt, yeah that's a lovely guy i'm sure he'll come on um yeah he's like hidden away in the countryside somewhere uh but yeah. i i kind of i i really like them for um They've been a company that's been around for a long time and have always been on the kind of like edge of kind of art and design, like where they meet. Absolutely. Um, and they've been doing their kind of, they've been doing their own thing doggedly for a long time. And they've just got their, they've just got a very um, focused kind of vision of, um, of what they are and, you know they're good enough and cool enough that it mean that that people they're like the trendsetters you know um mm. and they and the fact that they're still doing that like 10 years later i just i just think it's pretty cool so yeah how about you marcus i think i will i'd like yeah. someone from like and um, just because the studios that are quite close to us at ak but like someone from animate or from 
Golden Wolf just because that those studios have like very specific um, styles of work. Um, it'd be quite, I'd be quite interested to see just you know from well, quite pleased say we've had them both. So both, but but we 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 are having other speakers returning, so there's no harm in that. No, there um, you go. So. <laughs> Thank you, you very much. Um, yeah. <laughs> say again. Just need, right. need to dig back through the archives. I know, dig back. So, um, right. I'm just going to on on that note. I'm going to tee up who we've got coming up because um, we have got in August week. Thankfully, because of being remote, we are able to get some international people. So, we've got people crap and G Monk. Um, otherwise known as Bradley Monkovitz and Mike Wingleman, or the other way around. And then returning, who've both been here before, is Territory and Electric Theatre. So that'll be David Sheldon Hicks and James Stindle. So um, David was our very first speaker. Um, and then we're nearly there with September and October, but I'll be announcing them soon. But thank you so much, guys, for doing a weird sort of no audience talk um it's been some <laughs> great comments and so really appreciated it's yeah, um thank you thank you, thank you very much for giving us your time um yeah please anybody if you want to leave your feedback and make suggestions about um anyone you think that we should be speaking to i'll i'll leave the contact details at the end join up with the meetup group and um yeah, put August in your diaries and we will be back then. So thank you guys. And uh, that's it from us. Cool. cool. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.